Carla Gutierrez is an esteemed editor from her work on films such as RBG and Julia. Now she makes her directorial debut with a film about Frida Kahlo. I'm Tom Powers, and this is Pure Nonfiction. Today, Frida Kahlo is a ubiquitous icon. Key points of her biography are well known. Her marriage to muralist Diego Rivera, her lifelong health problems, including a miscarriage, and her numerous affairs with notable men and women. During her lifetime, her paintings were overshadowed by Rivera's career, but after her death in 1954, at the age of 47, her paintings became world famous for expressing her inner life in her singular style that combines Mexican traditions and surrealism. Her story has been told in different forms before, but Carla Gutierrez takes a unique approach by focusing on Frida's own words from her diaries, letters, and interviews that capture her expressive and sometimes caustic voice, performed by an actress in the original Spanish. The film taps a deep archive of photographs, but the strongest visuals are Frida's own paintings. Carla worked with Mexican animators to help us see those images in a new way. It's a bold choice that won over audiences at the Sundance Film Festival. Variety critic Carlos Aguilar called the film raw, vulnerable, and refreshing. For Carla, her directorial debut comes after a long editing career. She grew up in Peru and moved with her family to the United States at the age of 14. Today, she and I live in the same town of Montclair, New Jersey, and we held this conversation in person. As we began... I was thinking of a scene in her film when Frida first comes to the U.S. I asked Carla to describe her own arrival. I remember it was a February morning. I uh, arrived in Boston, so it was a bit of a, just a cultural shock for the weather. I had never seen snow. (laughs) (laughs) So I remember that night there was heavy snow in Boston. So I was like, okay, I might need different shoes. I don't know (laughs) what, I didn't really understand the concept of snow boots, but, um, but I think the two biggest things that I remember was that my family did not arrive at a immigrant enclave, so so we were, you know, it was a big cultural shock. And I think that, you know, the people that I interacted with, you know, defined me um, very, you know, very quickly. Like I was, I was the other. I was the immigrant. I was, I was actually exoticized quite quickly. Like I remember a kid coming behind me a boy and saying rico suave like in my ear and you know in like a very sexy way (laughs) whatever (laughs) if you could call that sexy but it was kind of scary you know it was this like how do they view me um because i am a pretty light-skinned latina like i was you know i was a white girl in peru uh but here i was definitely somebody with a heavy accent learning english so so there was that um you know, this country has given me so much, but it hasn't, you know, completely been welcome to me all the time. And the other thing that I remember, you know, kind of having a huge sh- a cultural shock with was, you know, coming face to face with the capital, like the middle of, you know, capitalism mm-hmm. and, and, and people consuming a lot. Like, and, and, and at that time, I felt it very much wasteful. Like, I remember going to the grocery store and there was just so much and everything was packaged and, you know, everybody, everything was like in plastic, you know, wrapping. And then you open the plastic wrapping and there was more plastic wrapping. <laughs> and then that was really, that was really shocking to me. And, and I really think that when I was doing research for Frida, kind of that interaction that she had with the United States felt very, you know, revel- relevant to my own experience. Like she had... You know, also she was a communist, so, and she was interacting with very rich, you know, people in New York, like artists, patrons, and, you know, people that supported the art in in New York City. So that was shocking for her, and I think it was shocking for me as well. So I'm curious how you adapted to, um, to feeling like an other. Did it make you want to become more like the people around you, or did you eventually find your tribe? Mm -hmm. I actually think I ended up embracing it. Um, 
because it just defined me so much. And I, I internalized it quite a bit. And I was very aware. Like I internalized the idea that, you know, I was being invited to some spaces, maybe because I was like the token Latina. Um, and I heard that, you know, very vocally, like when I got into, I got into a pretty good college that was very difficult to get into. And I was told, you know, straightforward, like, oh, you're here because you're a Latina. So like you... It's, are there students telling you this? Yeah. Or, or I mean, there were at that time, you know, it was what, the mid 90s and or late 90s. And there were, you know, articles in this, in the school newspaper talking about affirmative action and talking you know, talking about affirmative action as us taking a place for a more deserving stu student. So you end up internalizing that idea a lot. Like even now as an, you know, I've, I've had a long career as an editor. So when I get invited to, you know, talk about the craft or give, you know, panels or maybe to be a juror for a festival, the first thing, the first thing that comes into my mind is like, am I being invited just because I'm, a brown person just because I'm a woman of color. And then, you know, I tried to push that idea, you know, it's like, no, I've had, you know, there's a reason why I'm an experienced editor and I have a lot to offer because of the talent that I have, but it is very much internalized. And I think I embraced it. Like I identify myself first as an immigrant, second as a U.S. Latina, and then as a Peruvian American. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you went to college, but not initially for film. You, you uh, did other things. And, and how did you get drawn into documentary film? Um, so I went to school for math because <laughs> that was the language that, that was easy for me at the time as I was learning English. Um, and, but I was also doing studio art. I was making sculptures. Um, but I was really interested in, in exploring this idea of how to bring art to people, uh, in a way, what the muralist did in Mexico, which is included in our film, um, and and I watch one film. Um, I watch a film about um, I'm not gonna remember the name. Learning in Hoover in Hoover's. Oh yeah, Fe uh, fear and learning in yes. Hoover Elementary. Yeah, yeah. Um, which it which is about uh, a school in California at a time when laws were being passed in California that, if I remember correctly, would have required teachers to report on students that they thought were undocumented uh, immigrants. And so I think the filmmaker, I don't know if the filmmaker was a teacher. She I think was a she teacher. She was a teacher. It's so, a very powerful film. Very powerful. And it was the relationship between her and an undocumented student that was her student, and they got very close. And then she, you know, the film is about the relationship and what would she do if the law passed, right? What was her responsibility, legal responsibility? Um, and I remember watching that at school. I was one of probably four people watching the film in this theater, and it just really... It really, you know, kind of changed my mind. I was like, oh, look, like the power of art and the power of film to like, you know, present an intimate personal story that that opens up a lot of opinions or thoughts about a bigger political issue. So that's how I got interested in documentaries, kind of like looking at the power of documentaries to tackle social issues and then to present new worlds and new universe to, you know, people that that are distant from, from those, you know, from that co political context or social context. Um, I think that my attraction to different stories have, has changed throughout the years. Um, that is important to me, but also um, I pay a lot of attention to how a story can be told and how intimate it can be told. Um, and, you know, and sometimes maybe... I'd love to get involved with films that don't necessarily have like a social issue theme. Um, but, you know, I think the personal is also political and, and human issues are very important. And I think that's one of the reasons I wanted to make Frida. Uh, so I'll come to that in, in a minute. I, you went to Stanford's uh, MFA program for documentary and... Uh, and out of that program, how did you f choose to focus on editing for your career? Um, I remember that 
so Stanford, the Stanford Film Program really prepares you to be able to carry a film from beginning to end by yourself if you need to. It was a time where most of the funding for documentaries were coming from, you know, foundations and nonprofit and and ITVS. So so they prepare you to be a one person band, be able to produce, direct, shoot if you need to, um, do sound, and then edit your own stuff. And Production kind of gave me a stomachache that I did not enjoy. <laughs> <laughs> At the beginning, it was really hard for me to like ask people to do things for me. I mean, you're asking for access. It's really you're asking for permission um, to come and interrupt people's lives. And that was a difficult process for me. While this kind of mental challenge in the edit um, was really enjoyable. Um, I've seen a lot of directors and even pe other people in my program at Stanford, you know, that was the stress that they had a really hard time with, like the stress of not being able to see a film from the beginning. Like you have to take so your they time were, and they building. they maybe were more comfortable on the producing end, uh, asking people questions, going into their lives. But when they got in the edit room, they felt stress and you felt the opposite. Yes. they. I mean, it's overwhelming, you know, to like to have so much material. And sometimes you go into that material without knowing what the film is about. Um, and I loved it. It was so enjoyable. And and I was, I, I think I also had the ability to kind of let go, like to be able to focus on the theme, like what was the emotional narrative of the film and be able to let go of things that did not serve that narrative. Um, and I think, you know, directors, and, you know, I, I include myself in that sometimes you know, carry the weight of responsibility to include every detail about the story in the film, um, which kind of dilutes the central theme a lot of times. I wonder how you learned as an editor to, you know, uh, speak up uh, for your vision for a film in a room with directors who, you know, by the time you've gotten to their project, they've been working on it for months, perhaps. They have a different investment into it. They think they know what's best and then you're sitting in the edit room and you have a you know counter idea that you need to put forward um, that takes a certain diplomacy confidence in your own uh, uh, ability how did you learn that um, so what when I when I left film school I was lucky to be mentored by a great editor Kim Roberts and I saw the way that she, um, you know, kind of handled the delicate space of the edit because there's, you know, there's a lot of investment in the film. I mean, it's the director's baby. Sometimes they lived with these pregnancies for years uh, and put a lot of, like, their own money into it. Um, and she was, like, very soft and, you know, in a way, like, you know, she was always kind of hugging the director as she was going through the process. And I quickly learned that, like, I love that. I'm learning a lot from that, but that's not my personality. <laughs> and I don't think I will be able to do that. I'm just very, like, I can't help myself from being very blunt and out, outspoken with my, with my opinions. Um, but what I've learned is that you have to really create a space of trust. And I think that people that have hired me knew that I was coming in with, you know, with kind of like, um, you know, a strong presence, but we were very clear that, you know, let's just be, let's just put all of our thoughts on the table very openly and that we're all working towards, you know, the film, making the film really beautiful and really strong. That my responsibility is both for the director's vision, but also for the film. And so sometimes I have to speak for the film itself. If the material is telling you that, you know, we need to think about it in a different way. Um, I also have a trick that I learned throughout the years, which is I always edit one scene in a very polished way so that it feels like a finished scene in the film so that the directors can watch, like get a sense of what the film might look like in the future. And that creates a lot of trust because then you can get really messy and, you know, and, and kind of like just 
chunk it out. I'm stealing this from another, the, the chunk it out comes from um, Mary Labson, I think I heard her say that. But yeah, like be really dirty and messy and raw in the process. But when you have the director see kind of like a glimpse of how cool it's going to look and how polished it's going to look, then you have the entire team have that like breathing space to feel, you know, trusting and feel, feel, feel really calm and then just go with like into the dirty process after that. So one more question before I get to Frida. Two of the significant films that you had edited before this were RBG and Julia uh, with the same team of directors, uh, Betsy West and Julia Cohen. Um, Who are amazing badasses of the documentary <laughs> world. And uh, I wonder what, you know, those are both biographies of women, accomplished women. Um, and I wonder what you learned from those projects about, you know, telling the story of an eventful life and having to make choices about it. Um, yeah, so so I have worked on quite a bit of uh, a number of uh, biographies and a number of films that you would consider celebrity films, which is, you know, there's a lot of celebrity films in our industry these days. Um, I am really interested in them. Like, I, I, I find some celebrity films really fascinating and illuminating if they, you know, if they use a celebrity as a conduit to bigger human themes or to kind of like explore maybe social issues or just, you know, our lives and our culture. Um, some of them are really well done, are really, really well done, and I get really into them. Um, and that's my aim with the work that I do. Um, you know, the idea that I always go into these films, like trying to stay away from just covering the person's entire life and going through a list of accomplishments. Like we must include this and like this happened next, right? Um, but really kind of like find a central theme and then build this character um, to really focus on that central theme. So, so for example, I always thought about RBG as you know, a film about like progress happens really slowly, but it's really worth it to, you, you know, put the work in and, and, and progress will happen at the end. And, and how does a woman in a man's world, you know, accomplishes that? Um, and with Julia, I always thought about that film as like, it's about pleasure and like actually jumping into, into desire and pleasure and like, going for it, even if you're in your 50s. Um, and, you know, same with Frida. We had, like, a central theme that, and then we built the entire biography around that. And with Frida, we always thought about containment, you know, what happens to a woman who chooses not to contain her voice um, and finds catharsis in that process. For her, it was creative process. Um, so... So, you know, even if you tackle a biography in a linear way, um, you know, you're curating a lot of things. You're selecting um, how to present that char char character. And for me, it's really important to, you know, to really be able to convey the message and to connect to the audiences that way. Uh, so you told me that uh, Frida Kahlo's work was something that you had encountered first as a young person and that had made a powerful impression on you. What, what did she mean to you as a, as a young person? Um, well, so I found her right, you know, we talked about my, my experience as an immigrant, and that's when I um, saw her first, you know, the first painting that I saw of hers was in college, and I was like a very recent immigrant. And she, it was a painting where she was um, showing kind of her relationship with America and her longing for Mexico because she spent three years here in the United States. And even though her paintings are all about her and they show her face, they're mostly self-portraits, um, I found myself and my emotions very much re reflected on that painting. And then as I continue discovering her art, you know, I had kind of like that same experience with, with many of her paintings. Um, you know, I have, I have so much, I have so much love and, and admiration for her 
first of all, because, because he, she was able to show me that my internal world was important, that she expressed, you know, her most intimate daily feelings. And that's all she could do. You know, she, she did not want to try to paint in abstract ways or be very intellectual about it. She kind of really painted from her heart. And, and I always found that she was showing me my own emotions through life. So, so I wanted to kind of like give audiences the same feeling through this film. So explain to me how this project came to be. How, like, how did you get connected to this as your first directorial enterprise? I mean, the story of my relationship with her art started, you know, decades ago to age myself. <laughs> um, but there's so many people in the world that have that same experience, right? It doesn't make me any, any you know, special. Um, but when I came to the story, I was very aware that, the, that her life had been told through books, a lot of books that her art had been, you know, really explored academically a lot, um, that there had been a number of documentaries and a few fiction films about her life. So why another one, <laughs> right? Why, why offer another film about, she's so well known. But when I started looking at the material, I saw that there was, a, I don't want to call it an opportunity, but this magic of like being able to read her words and seeing that she could po probably carry most of her own story. Um, I just realized that that had not been offered to people quite yet. Um, and, and then coming from understanding the experience that I could bring into a film like this uh, as an editor, an editor that had done biographies before and had done archival films before, I just felt that it was, you know, it was a, my film to make and, and, and now it had to happen now. Um, so yeah, so I came up but with a vision. Am, am I right idea. that the opportunity arose because someone told you that they were thinking about making a, a film about Frida and you raised your hand and said, I should be the one to do that? Yeah. No, it was, um, we, I had a conversation with Julie Cohen, who you mentioned, who had, um, we were talking, we were just talking about film and, and she kind of said like, Hey, have you thought of Frida Kahlo? I don't think there's a film, um, about her. And I, and I thought to myself, I don't think we had this conversation. It's just like, no, there's a lot of films about her. But also, like, let me look back at, at you know, but there, there hasn't been a documentary that I felt like had gotten me close to her. Um, there's been wonderful documentaries about her, but most of them and all of them have been from the distance of history of, you know, like hearing from art historians or other artists explain what she meant with her art, but that really had not focused on her voice. And I remember, you know, when I was in college reading her biography, I knew that there were some letters. I knew that she described some moments in her life. So I went back to those books and it probably like took two to three hours of me, you know, going back to that material when I was just like, holy cow, she can really tell us a lot of her life. Um, so, so that's how it all started. And then I called back Julie and just like, Julie. <laughs> and, you know, we talked to Julie and Betsy West and they came on board as uh, executive producers, really believing in, you know, not only me as a director, um, but also on the approach that I wanted to give to this story. You come to the story, you know you want to tell it through Frida's uh, own words. Um, uh, and how did the idea to use animation so extensively um, uh, uh, arise? And you know, how did you gain the confidence that that was going to work? Um, so that was an idea from the very beginning, um, probably within those two and three hours of me looking into the story. Um, and 
knew it was a con- it was going to be a controversial idea, and I knew that it was a bland move that I really wanted to make from the beginning. Also because, I mean, you know how animation works. If you're making that decision, it has to be done early on. Animation is a very involved process. You have to, you know, bring a team to collaborate with. Um, but there were two things that I kept thinking about. One is, you know, I know how it feels to sit and look at her paintings. I've spent time in museums where I, you know, was just standing in front of her paintings for who knows, like maybe an hour or so. I know how it feels to, you know, just pay attention to every detail of her paintings in books. And there is an experience there where you can like, you know, really develop a relationship and an emotional relationship to the paintings and really pay attention to the details, especially if you know about her life, because you know where those paintings are coming from. So all those details, you know, carry a lot of meaning and 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 carry a lot of information. And and I thought, OK, film is a different form. How do we bring how do we kind of replicate that experience in this cinematic universe that we're gonna create. And to me, um, animation was an obvious step to be able to guide the audience through those, through that emotional content in her painting, to be able to highlight kind of like what was happening in the scene at that point in the film. Um, and to also be able to stay with the paintings for a while in film form, right? Um, so, we never added any outside elements to the animation, but we took the elements in the paintings and then we started moving, adding movement to it, again, to underlight or highlight some aspects in the painting that I wanted you to pay attention to. Um, and, you know, and I think just the idea of how are we going to get into her internal um, world? Um, you know, I knew that I only wanted to use archival footage. Um, I knew that I didn't want to use any contemporary interviews or any contemporary uh, footage of maybe her house, Casa Azul, or Mexico. I wanted to live in the world that really inspired her. But then, you know, how do we go from that world into, you know, actually hearing about her inspiration, actually hearing about her emotions, and for me, the art was that so I wanted to for the audience to really have this sense of emerging themselves into those paintings and animation really can really gave us that you know possibility um there's also you know I was editing the film myself and I was able to see all those scenes and sequences with the static art and they did not quite have you know that magic that they have when you are seeing them in the museum or seeing them in a, in a book. Because again, film is a different art form. So we went for, we went for it. It strikes me there must have been a real leap of faith. Like you have your idea in your head of how this could be realized. Then you need to wait for the animators to execute it. Um, you know, when did you realize, oh, this is going to work? Um, so the first thing that we did animatics for, so we took it, um, you know, we took it kind of far in terms of like being able to see how it would feel in animation was really the opening sequence of, um, of the film. We had a version that was very close really early on. We had a version of the opening that was much longer, but it was kind of like the same concept of the open that you see in the film. Um, and we, worked, we had a lot of conversations with the animators about, you know, um, going from one painting to another, but always keeping the essence that she both was painting herself and also she needed to paint, that there was an urgency. And that's what the opening is about. Like, you know, it's a woman that, that found herself in painting and in, she had this, you know, need to always be painting. Um, so, so we tried that and there was something, you know, I mean, we made a lot of changes as we progressed, but our animation team just, you know, that was wonderful and worked with us and we were able to see like that 
first scene, right, that I present to directors, something that kind of gave us a glimpse of how animation could look like in the future. And then we got really messy and dirty with the rest of the film. You could chunk it out. Yeah. So then we chunked it out and we, you know, and then we did animations like really, really late in the process. Um, you came to Frida originally as a young person and, uh, and were excited about her for certain reasons. When you make this film, you're a few decades older. Um, did you see her life in a different way? Yes. I think that I, um, I started connecting and, again, seeing my own um, feelings and experiences in her in other paintings um, as I was maturing as a woman um, and, and connecting with her art in a deeper way. Um, you know, the paintings that I, uh, navigated toward, like that, you know, really drew me in when I was a young woman were the heartache paintings, like being dumped, you know, uh, my heart broken or, you know, the, the painting that reflected my immigrant, my feelings about immigrating to the States. Um, later on, it was really, um, you know, one painting in particular, for example, of her miscarriage, that w that is a very, in a way, very literal. You know, it's a surrealistic painting, but it's also very literal and very raw, and and quite a bit violent. Um, but I experienced a miscarriage like so many of us do, and I realized that you know when that happened to me, and I started telling some friends that they had also experienced something similar, and it, it, you know it made me think that like still at this time, women don't share those experiences. Like, again, this kind of behind doors is the mundane, right? Is it important enough to talk about? Uh, and Frida was putting it in paintings at that, at that time in very public ways. Um, so, so yeah, as I'm sure as a woman, you know, or I've trans, you know, I've had like moments of big transitions in my life. It's been a, a deepening connection to to her art and even the passion for life that she shows in her paintings. Like I have been really seeing that a lot uh, and connecting to that a lot. But on my last podcast, I interviewed Alyssa Wilkinson, the critic, and uh, when I asked her about trends in documentary, she described one thing she sees increasingly is documentaries that begin with a kind of recap of what is going to come in the documentary. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, you managed to not do that, uh, in, uh, in Frida, uh, you, you let us enter the story and, and let things be revealed, uh, along the way. Um, how did you, you know, manage that in a time when it's really bucking the trends of, uh, of what's happening in commercial documentaries? Um, yeah, I mean, there is a tendency to, um, you know, even if we're dealing with, with people figures that are well known um, to kind of like present a summary of their lives before, you know, you go into examining their lives again throughout the film. Um, I think there were two reasons, and this was a conversation that we had with our team. I, I just really want to mention that, that, you know, filmmaking, and especially for me, it was really important to get the right support with a team that really lifted my vision up. Um, because I find, you know, I find the process to be really film is a collaborative form and and thank goodness because it would feel so, so lonely and I would be so lost without the people that helped me, uh, especially my, my producer, Katya McGuire and David Teague, who was our supervising editor. But I remember having a lot of conversations about that with David, um, how to start the film. And... You know, I mean, one was just trusting that she is a really well-known figure, that we do not have to, you know, tell a lot of our viewers, like, who she is, because they're already going to come in with some knowledge of who Frida Kahlo is. And we are actually hoping that this film can give them a different understanding or, a, you know, um, a different way of seeing her or perceiving her. Um, but also, you know... For our opening in particular, you know, we really wanted to present this theme and present this person, the essence of this person. Um, and, 
she's a painter and you see that very clearly in this kind of like quiet opening that we have uh, and she's a painter that you know has poured her own self into her canvas um, and that she needs the painting to survive um, so it felt to us that what we were putting together was really presenting our theme it's like this woman that you know could not contain her voice and her voice is in her art and that's enough like you know I think that 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 there is, you know, in the conversation that you had um, previously, you know, it is very clear that that in this, you know, in the state of documentaries right now, uh, streamers and news, you know, um, and broadcasters have this need to keep the audience, um, you know, tune in, you know, after the first few minutes of the film. But if you give them enough mystery and you present the essence of a character, I think you can do that without having to rely on this icon montage of who this person is and give us everything, you know, in the first minute of the film. So we really want to do that and I hope it works. You talked about building a uh, team around you and uh, one of the things I want to ask about is, you know, building a team that c could bring more insight into Frida as um as Mexican, you, you have, have a Latin American background from Peru. It's a different cultural uh, tradition than uh, the Mexico. So, um, you know, can you talk about uh, the, the the efforts you were making to you know to to make sure you were being authentic to that? Yeah, I mean, I knew that I was bringing, um, you know, myself some cultural knowledge. Um, and, and closeness to to the world that also created Frida. Um, you know, I come from the other capital of, of the Spanish, <laughs> the Spanish, you know, empire. Um, but it was it was important for me to have an all Latino crew. Um, we joke around with Teak that David Teak that he was the only gringo in, in our team. Um, but also really fun collaborators in Mexico. Um, I wanted you know, to inject Mexico into the story as much as I could. Um, because, you know, they learn about muralism, they learn about Diego Rivera and Frida from the very beginning. And they also have like a very unique, um, you know, kind of like unique experience with looking at their roots, uh, their indigenous roots in a very different way that most of Latin Americans do. You know, there was the big cultural revolution in Mexico and there is this um, kind of like honoring of their indigenous roots that you don't see in a lot of other places. Um, it is very complicated, <laughs> but it's there. Um, and so we, you know, our composer is from Michoacan. He lives in LA now. Um, our entire animation team we found on Instagram, uh, but they're mostly a Mexican female animation team, uh, which was really exciting to work with. And we wanted to finish the film in Mexico. So we did our sound design with a Mexican team, um, you know, the color down there. Um, and, and that was really special. I mean, I learned about how Mexico also sees Frida because obviously she's an international phenomenon and a lot of people react to like how commercialized she's become or what, you know, kind of like a flattened icon or symbol um, that is not, you know, we don't see her complexity. We don't see her messiness a lot. Um, a lot of people don't even know her art that well. They just see the image of her face everywhere. Right. So I really wanted to learn from them and bring them into the into the um, creative process. Um, I mean, really, again, the creative process is such a collaboration and the film kind of takes place in those conversations with with the people that you bring to support you. So there's always a point in making a documentary film where it just looks like a mess. Um, and uh, and. As an editor, when you're working for other directors, you're often the person who holds the responsibility of turning that mess into uh, something that's going to work and, and maybe 
reassuring the directors that uh, mm-hmm. that uh, that this is uh, going to work. Um, but in the case of this film, you, you know, you were your own editor. Uh, you didn't, you know, you, yes, you had collaborators, but you didn't have <laughs> someone else, you know, backing you up in a in a meaningful way. So, uh, and I remember, you know, speaking with you at, at uh, sometime in the last year when you, you were kind of at that point where you know this film is a mess. I don't know, um, you know, crossing my fingers that we're going to get a film out of uh, this, which is not a unique experience, it's an experience that everyone uh, yeah. has. Um, I mean, can you talk about, uh, as a first-time director, you know, taking on a big project, there's a, you know, certain amount of vulnerability and, um, you know, and uncertainty that must come with confronting, is this really going to come together? Uh, uh, I, I wonder how you worked through that um gosh i didn't sleep much for a few months um it it was hard it was hard because you're right as an editor as an editor who has gone through a few of these right like i you all i think i feel like even as an editor i always had imposter syndrome at the very beginning like i always at the very beginning of a project when you're just like drawing in the material um, and you're kind of like following every thread, every potential narrative thread as you're, you know, just watching things. Um, it's very scary. You don't know if you're going to be able to pull it off. But being both the director and editor, that feeling was very strong for many months. Um, and I actually feel that, again, it was... I was very smart at the beginning. Like I knew that that was going to happen. Um, and I knew that I needed a strong sounding, creative sounding board that where I could, you know, I could pull from just even emotionally like trust of myself that I would have the support from other people telling me that like, you'll find it. Like you've done this before, you will find it. Um, and and I have to say like, you know, we found a really you know, a really, really, really great sounding board with Amazon MGM Studios. Um, you know, we work closely with Brianna O, and that was just really a wonderful experience because a lot of times we were actually hearing from her questions that would bring us back to our original vision, uh, which I thought was incredibly productive. Um, but yeah, really putting that team together was kind of like to me, it's like, that's what I gave myself the most credit for, because I was, uh, you know, I knew this is going to be hard. I'm wearing two hats. I really need strong sounding boards that could, you know, maybe help me emotionally as well, but really push me, nudge me and challenge me creatively. Um, and, and together we, you know, kind of build the trust, you know, to be able to make the film. Um, but it is, I mean, you know, I always say like, can I swear? Okay. I always say like, you know, filmmaking is like a really fucking really hard thing to do. The final film, you know, feels like, oh, it had to be like this, you know, from the very beginning, it feels so easy. It flows, right. It moves and it's only 90 minutes long. Um, but it, it takes a lot. It becomes a mess and it is a mess. It's not a film until it becomes a film. And sometimes it becomes a film really later on, later in the process. Um, but it is, you know, really relying on the collaboration and those conversations and and staying steady in the path. You, you know what your end needs to be. You know what the theme is. Um, you know what you want the audience to take out of the film, right? So you just keep keep working really hard towards that goal. And for me... It was, you know, I really wanted the audience, especially women. I think that I was thinking about women, you know, most of my time. But like, you know, to feel that, you know, having an outlet to express your true voice in an honest way, even if that's difficult because you're showing things that are, you know, rough and they they don't show you in perfect ways, um, that that's really cathartic and that's a really good thing. That was, I wanted people to take that away from seeing Frida do that. Um, and, you know, if we manage to do that with one person, then hopefully we've, we've succeeded. 
Wait, but can I, before you, can I tell the story of okay. like, so, so Tom, you know, you and I live in the same town, but even before I started like pitching the project, I was just thinking about the idea. It was probably like a week after, you know, that popped into my head. Um, so, and just to set the scene here, this was in COVID time. So I certainly hadn't done that much socializing. You invited our family to your backyard, and I can remember, like, it was such in COVID times that even, you know, I wasn't sure, would it be okay to go into the house to, you know, use the restroom? Yeah, and we were sitting pretty far away from each other. So Over a we were, fire. like, yeah. speaking in- loudly. But obviously I have, you know, an encyclopedia of documentary films in, in front of me, and I'm, you know, I can't sleep because I have this idea in my head. So I asked you, like, what would you recommend I watch? Like if I want to watch films that use, you know, uh, a figure's voice to tell the story, like tell me what to watch. And and you said immediately, well, Carla, if I was you, for example, and I would want to make a film about Frida Kahlo, I would watch this and this and this. And I was, it was, it was really a funny, funny, amazing moment because it's just like, oh my God, does this man know me so well that he would know that I would make a film about Frida? Uh, it was great. <laughs> and I was like, oh, okay, I can't keep a secret. Maybe I said it with my face or something. I don't know. <laughs> uh, I don't know what made that uh, pop into my head at the time. You know, I was impressed that you were going to take that on and, you know, and maybe it was... Uh, you know, I wonder if it was this kind of COVID era where we were all, you know, rethinking about, um, you know, what are we doing with our time? What, what are we doing with our time left? And what are the things that we, you know, that we feel are inside us and need to come out? Yeah. And it was, you know, I mean, Frida really started painting seriously because she was stuck at home after her accident. So who knows, maybe that's what gave me the bug to maybe I should direct or I should give myself this, this, you know, challenge. Okay, that's the real end of our interview. Thanks to Carla Gutierrez. Her film Frida begins streaming on Amazon Prime on March 15th. Thanks to the School of Visual Arts MFA program for social documentary, Carla and I held a live conversation about Frida at the school that was meant to be on this episode, but I forgot to press record. Carla was kind enough to sit for a second conversation that you just heard. Thanks to our team, who would never forget to press record if they were with me, series producer Hannah Nordenswan, newsletter manager Bella Racklin, and web designer Cross Strategy. Our music is composed by Andre Williams, and our executive producer is Raphael Nehausen. I'm Tom Powers. Follow us on Instagram and sign up for our newsletter at purenonfiction.net.